I woke up this one Tuesday morning, and I was absolutely freezing. So I wrapped myself in a blanket. I went and ate some oatmeal. And as I picked up my morning coffee, I stared out this large window overlooking the river. And all I could think of was, how did I get to this? How did I end up in a room surrounded by complete strangers, all waiting to be evaluated by a hospital psychiatrist? You see, we were the people who lost it all. Just 24 hours earlier, I believed I failed. I failed myself, I failed my family, I failed my friends, I failed my community. My life, my spirit, my soul, so completely low, I nearly jumped off a bridge. But me being who I am and always wanting to make people feel better and make them laugh, I looked at this complete room of strangers and I said, so, what are y'all in for? <laughs> a college professor, a college student, two 18-year-old high school students, a grandfather, a mother who had given birth just four days earlier, and three people who were in the detox unit. They were all with me, bound by the one thing we all had in common, mental illness. Yes? Ladies and gentlemen, I have lived mental illness, and I proudly stand here before you today because I'm not ashamed. So how did I get here? How does someone like me who on paper has everything they could have ever wanted, end up believing that this world would be so much better off if they were no longer in it. Well, for starters, I'm the mother of three, all boys. I married, and at that time, I was working not just full time, I mean all the time. Day, night, weekends, vacations, holidays, I poured myself into the work I did because I loved what I was doing and I loved working and helping my community. Now that, combined with raising this young family and all the things that come along with it, whether it be lunches, homework, after school activities, dinner, laundry, I was taking on too much. I was taking care of everyone else around me, my family, my husband, my community, my colleagues, everyone except for me. Now, on the outside, I looked great. I was thin, my hair was done, my nails were done. Believe me, I like to look good. But on the inside, I was neglecting myself. I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating properly, I wasn't taking time out for myself. And to be honest, up until that point, I really, truly believed that taking time out for yourself was completely selfish. But like they tell you on an airline, in case of a sudden drop in pressure, apply your oxygen mask first before assisting others. And it's true. If you're not healthy, how can you effectively help anyone else? And it's just not your physical health but your mental health. Now, I had struggled with bouts of mental illness for most of my entire adult life, whether it be a panic attack here or there or little bits of OCD, but nothing that ever actually needed to be treated. You know, I'd do what we all do. I'd read a few books, I'd go online, I'd do some research, and for the most part, it helped. But what I didn't realize was underneath it all was this underlying, growing anxiety. I just thought, that's who I was. I was a nervous person. I didn't fly. I didn't take the subway. I didn't drive until I moved to Jacksonville. <laughs> I just thought that was what my normal was. That's who I am, an overly cautious person. But as I later found out, that was not a healthy, normal way to live. 
So realizing that I had this anxiety and then the subsequent depression was not easy. From time to time, I would talk to friends about it and they would answer how friends always answer you. Don't worry about it, Janine. Oh, you'll be fine. Don't think about it. Here, drink some wine. <laughs> and believe me, I did drink my wine. But as time went on, the anxiety got much, much worse. I didn't enjoy stuff. I didn't want to go out of the house. I didn't want to do things. I became withdrawn. I wanted to stay away from family and friends. And I would lay in bed, and then came that depression. And I couldn't get myself out of bed. Even things like taking a shower took all the strength I had in me. Now remember, I had a job, and I had these children to take care of. And I was doing it, and I was out there pushing, 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 when inside I was struggling. And the whole time, all I ever wanted was to someone say, you know what, Janine, I've been there too, and it sucks. But I found no person. I found no person that was going to tell me it will get better. So I did what we all do. I went on Google, and I Googled mental health and mental illness, and I found numerous organizations that supported mental illness and supported mental health but they all had that same corporate feel. You know, the one where if you're lonely, if you're sad, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, call your doctor, speak to your licensed mental health care professional. So that's exactly what I did. I told my husband and I decided to see a psychiatrist and he listened to what I have to say and he's like, okay, here you go, here's a prescription. Um, you're gonna get some side effects. See you in six weeks. Wow, gee, thank you. A few weeks after, I decided to go see a psychologist. And they listened and listened and wrote. And then they said, time's up. Come back in two weeks. And I thought, wow, I'm not feeling any better. In fact, I felt so much worse. But how could I? Aside from the fact that I was paying them a ton of money, I shouldn't feel like I was a burden to these people. I was trying to get healthy. I was trying to protect my mental health. But that hospital visit was going to change my life. You see, I didn't see what we think of when we think of mental illness. They weren't addicts or bipolar or schizophrenic. These were people who just weren't well and they weren't getting the help and the treatment they needed, that individualized treatment. Now don't get me wrong. Our mental health care professionals do understand, but it's to an extent. They get the psychology, they get the brain chemistry and the genetics of, our, of it all. And our friends, our family, they too understand because they want us to be healthy, they want us to thrive, they want us to do well. But no one, no one understands what it's like to have mental illness except someone who has lived with mental illness. And now here I am in a room full of strangers and they're all telling me their whole life story and their deepest, darkest secrets. When one of them comes up to me, a six foot five African-American male who was built like the Titanic and with tears in his eyes, he put his hand on mine and he said, thank you. You were the most helpful person I have met. This man was a US veteran struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder a U.S. veteran, and he was thanking me. Well, I thought about that moment for the rest of the day, and I thought about, what are we missing here? What is it that we are doing wrong? What can we do to change this? And most importantly, what can I do? Heck, I'll go out there, I'll change this. So let's look at the facts. The National Alliance on Mental Illness approximates that one in four individuals struggles with a mental illness, or basically, you guys over there. <laughs> but for those of you who are like me and not good at math, that's 62 million. 62 million adults living with, in the U.S. struggle with mental illness. At least 15 million of them alone struggle with depression. Right here in Northeast Florida, 
we have more suicides per year than homicides. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Google it yourself. I'm serious. More suicides than homicides. NASA, Clay, Duval, St. John's County. We hear about suicide on the news every single day. Wrong. We hear about homicide every day. Think about when the last time you heard suicide was. The Florida Times Union recently reported that the Duval County Jail System is the largest provider of mental health services in Northeast Florida. Our jail, not our hospitals, not our doctors, not our psychologists or our social workers, our jail system. Meanwhile, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, a U.S. governmental administration, states that in the state of Florida, 88% of individuals with mental illness live at home. That's right, we're not homeless, we're not living in the jails, we're not living in the streets or in the state hospital, we're at home. Well, you know those people in our jail system? They too once started at home. Think about that. This needs to change. And how do we evoke this change? Well, how are we treating mental illness in America? Think about this. Primarily one of two ways, psychiatry and psychology, right? We know that psychiatry works. We know that medication works. We know psychology works. We know that talk therapy works. But with these come hefty prices, co-pays, co-insurances, side effects. And if you don't have health care, you're paying a lot of money or you're not getting services. And when do we treat mental illness? When we get to crisis mode. Yes, when people are so desperate that they can't sleep, they can't eat, they cannot get out of bed. Or worse, when they consider suicide or attempt it. Well, this brings me to a new plan. Think about this. Look at how we're treating mental illness. It's the reason why I founded Where is the Sunshine? What if we approach mental health like we approach other illnesses? Through early intervention. Not just simple early intervention, early intervention with the use of peer support. Well, it's happening, ladies and gentlemen, and it's happening right here in Jacksonville right now. Organizations like Mind Over Music Movement, I Still Matter, Active Minds at the University of North Florida, Destigmatize Me, we have joined together. We are out there helping the people who look like us. And we have joined with our National Alliance on Mental Illnesses local chapter, NAMI, to create a mental health renaissance. And we are working with Mental Health America, with the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, and with the American Foundation on Suicide Prevention and all other organizations to reach a broader audience so people who look like me know that there is help out there from people who look like them. But we need more. We need our lawmakers involved. We need our law enforcement involved. We need our mental health professionals on board we need them to know that we are available to support them, to provide services, and help them out. They say in cancer, the earlier it is caught, the better your chances are for recovery and survival. We need to look at mental illness the same exact way. We should never let anyone get to stage four. I had to get to stage four in order for my life to become something more amazing than it ever has been. But I assure all of you, this is a rarity. Most people don't have this. Most people are alone, scared, frightened. They need your support. They need your help and compassion because these are the people who are on the grocery line, on your kid's carpool line outside of school. They're your kid's teachers, they're your friends. They are the people sitting next to you. I recently participated in the Out of Darkness Walk for Suicide Prevention. And as I crossed the Main Street Bridge, I looked down at the water and I looked at my husband and my three boys. 
I did not feel like a burden to any of them. In fact, I am the happiest I have ever been. Thank you.